you'll take your hymnals, turn to page 263, and we're going to sing Revive Us again. If everybody will stand, please. so grateful to be here today. Lord, it's such a pleasure to be back in your house, worshiping the one that is worthy to be worshiped. Holy God, we pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit to be uplifted in this place today in every heart. And Lord, especially me, empty me of me and fill me with thy Holy Spirit that I'll preach your word according to your way and your will. Lord, we're so grateful today, Lord, to know that we can come to you. We know there's been a lot of things happening, even with the things that has been in the news today about our, our president. Lord, we just pray that you would just watch over him, all of our nation, and all of our nation's leaders. Lord, regardless of what kind of party that man decides, but Lord, we know that you've appointed these leaders for a reason. That, Lord, we should always be praying about them and for them. Lord, we pray for our church. We pray for the vacation Bible school we're about to intake. And Lord, in August, as we start our revival, we pray, Lord, that everything is always according to your will and your way. So today, Lord, I pray for those who could not be here for whatever the reason. I ask you, Lord, to just bless them, remind them that we've missed them. And Lord, you remind us that we're in the house of the Lord. We're prepared to worship the one who is worthy. And we thank you through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good, morning. good morning. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord. Just a few announcements. We're going to go on with our service. Uh, just to let you know that we are having Vacation Bible School starting next Monday. Jessica, where are you? Okay, you got anything you want to mention? Okay, looking forward to Vacation Bible School. Also, again, reminding you, for those that don't know, we're going to be having revival in August. That'll be each Monday night at 7 o'clock. Now, we'll have different speakers each Monday, uh, lining up like i got two black people, and right now I've got three preachers ready. So just want to let you know that that's going to start at 7, and each church, if they can, 
will furnish their singing and they'll be bringing people with them and I hope that you'll support this. Uh, I told uh, some of the folks, uh, one of the guys I'm really looking forward to hearing is a pastor friend of mine named Harold and he's, uh, he's got a smile from here to next Tuesday and I don't know, we may have to put something up here because as excited as he gets, he's liable to go through the ceiling. So I just want you to know it's going to be a joyful time. Be praying about our revival. Bible study and youth missions continue this Wednesday. Uh, again, we're in uh, Second Peter. Second Peter is the, the swan song of Peter as he's about to die, but he's bringing forth the things that he's learned and the things that you and I will see according to the last days. Now, Second Peter and Jude, they sort of run together. But Jude, is, again, is he's talking about what is going to happen at that time and what it is is false teachers. In Christ's day, it was false prophets. But in our day, the last days, it's false teachers. And so we're seeing a lot of that. And you might be shocked at what some of the things is identifying because it's just wide open right before you. So probably next Sunday, Lord willing, I'm going to preach on the book of Jude, and uh, we'll uh, get, sort of get kicked off in that and give you an idea. Uh, if not, I'll preach on Second Peter, but I feel led to do that for one of those because of the Bible study and some of you that can't be here for that. So I hope you will. All right, ladies' prayer group. And do you have anything? Yeah. Um, we're going to finish up the book that we're on now. I ordered only one copy of a new Bible study that I think you really enjoy. It comes with video access. So I want everyone to come and look at it. And if you like it, then I'll order a book for everybody. But I just ordered one because I wanted to be sure it's something that you all would, would want to go through. But I think you'll enjoy it. Okay, ladies, I hope you'll attend. Now, men, we're going to be having our fellowship. We've got Logan's down here, but Brother Sam, you have any idea? We're going to wait till we get together? Okay, we'll be here by 6 o'clock uh, Thursday evening, guys, so we can make a decision on where we're going. And if it's Logan's, it's fine. If it's not Logan's, it's still fine. We do have a good time. Hope that you'll be a part of that fellowship. It's important that we have fellowship one with another. And this, as I mentioned, even in our Bible studies, we uh, if you want to know more about somebody, spend time with them. And if you don't want to know, then you just don't spend time with them, and that's what it is. So when we spend time in fellowship, we're spending time with the Lord, and that's bringing us together closer and closer to get to know Him more so intimately than if we do not. So please, it's an important thing in fellowship for the ladies and for the men of this church. Hope that you'll be a part of that. All right, any announcements I may have missed? One, I'm not in a suit today for the very first time that I can ever remember. And the reason behind it, I just kept on. I, I got so blame hot yesterday getting groceries and I got a little sick on my stomach and they warned me about getting hot. And, you know, I have to sort of cool my preaching down so I won't be preaching real, real hard. And, uh, and I thought I'd get a laugh. Anyway, the point is, uh, I hope you'll forgive me, but if you, if you think that your preacher needs to have a towel, and I'll be honest with you, I'll put one right back on next week. And you may say, well, why would anybody want to do that? Well, when I was a deacon in my home church, had uh, some very sophisticated women and they were beautiful, sweet, wonderful, well Bible, uh, and I mean really grounded in the Word of God. And my pastor said, would you do me a favor? And I said, what's that? He said, in our next deacon's meeting, will you say no tie in July? And he said, I'm about to burn up up there when I'm preaching. I said, okay. So I mentioned it, and everybody was for it because they didn't have to wear a tie either. And so anyway... Uh, this precious lady came to me, and her husband had played in, in Thunder Road and all these things. He was a principal in North Gaston and uh, voted the number one Santa Claus in America. Uh, his name was Charles Elledge. He was around 6'7", weighed about 370 pounds, big, huge man, huge man. 
but he was the bootlegger in Thunder Road when Robert Mitchum uh, did that. But anyway, his wife said to me, pre he, excuse me, she didn't say preach, she said, Deacon Leroy, you tell them I'll be back when they put their ties on. I said, yes, ma'am. So anyway, I, that's why you may be find it surprising because I did, but it was a teaching tool to me that don't take nothing for granted. Somebody may be offended, and if you are, I promise you, I won't be offended if you say put the tie back on. Okay? So I just want you to know that I love you. All right, Sandy, let's go on with our service. Think a thing about it, preacher. <laughs> Jenny can't see. She said, I can't believe you're going to church without a tie. And I said, well, come on to church and I'll put one on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, 375. Yeah, 375. Tis, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. If you'll stand, please. We sing the doxology. I want to see a smile on everyone's face. Come on, people. It's not that bad today. I know it's hot, but we're in a cool place. Just look like you kissed a pickle. That'll do it. <laughs> okay. If, right. you, if you'll stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise God. 
be seated. Second Samuel chapter 19. Thank you. You're welcome. 
2 Samuel chapter 19. The past couple of months, I have uh, lost a lot of schoolmates and friends. And the last two weeks, especially, uh, some very close friends. And it's sad. Uh, this past week, uh, funerals and people that you just didn't think that much about dying, but the truth of the matter is it puts you to thinking. You know, most of them had just turned 80 years old. And I couldn't help but think this past Wednesday, my dear friend, Brother Jim, he just turned 80 years old, and, and I'm looking at 80 in October. Now, I know some of you are older than that, and some of you are not, but I know that Kay's looking at that age in January. Sam, he's uh, made the corner, and so we're going to have a lot of 80-year-old folks plus in here. And I just want to say this to you because this was something that I believe was on my heart and mind. So I was wondering what God had to say about people's age, especially the elderly. And so I spent a lot of time in, in working on this. This took all week long, and I've changed it so many times. But I came up with a fellow's name by the name of Barzilla. Barzilla. And it's in 2 Samuel chapter 19, beginning in verse 31. So let's begin reading there. And Barzilla the Gileadite came down from Rogalim and went over Jordan with the king to conduct him over Jordan. Now Barzilla was a very aged man, even fourscore years old. That means he was 80. And he had provided the king's substance while he lay at Mahanam, for he was a very great man. I mean, he was rich. And the king said unto Barzilla, Come thou over with me, and I will feed thee with me in Jerusalem. Now the war's over, and all this time Barzella had made sure that when David was in need and had no resources, this man from another nation provided him with food and everything, as I mentioned a little bit later on. I am this day fourscore years old. This man, it was his birthday. And can I discern between good and evil? Can thy servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any more the voice of singing men and singing women? Wherefore then should thy servant be yet a burden unto my lord the king? Thy servant will go a little way over Jordan with the king, and why should the king recompense it with me such a reward? Let thy servant, I pray thee, turn back again, that I may die in mine own city and be buried by the grave of my father and my mother. But behold thy servant Chimam. Let him go over with my lord the king and do to him what shall seem good unto thee. And the king answered, Chimam shall go over with me and I will do to him that which shall seem good unto thee. And whatsoever thou shalt require of me, that will I do for thee. And all the people went over Jordan. And when the king was come over, the king kissed Barzela and blessed him. And he returned to his own place. Now before us in our text is an 80-year-old man. And he's having his birthday. And, and Barzela had an important matter that was on his mind. And it can't be dismissed with you and me. Uh, I'm not going to use the little the 20 year old that was shot yesterday and died, but we don't know whether we're young or old our day that God calls us home, and we have to realize that even with that, we have murderers and people that would take our life before our time. So you have to realize: Are you ready? And when I mention this, I want you to listen very carefully. You may say, that person was murdered and I know they was going to start the church this Sunday. How many Sundays did they have to go to church that they wasted? So you must realize it's up to you, not mom, dad, not brother, sister, husband, or wife. It's up to you to prepare and be ready for your day to meet the Lord. And it is nothing to do with anybody else but you. Now Barzella was about to be rewarded by David. 
And he said, you know, I want to reward you for what you did. I mean, we were in dire need. And he says, you don't need to reward me. <laughs> I've got more important matters on my mind. I mean, I'm fixing to die. Well, you don't look like you're about to die. He said, I know. But I know I had 80 years behind me. Now, I don't know how many years I have ahead of me, but I know it's not 80. I know for a fact that my time is short. And now, above all times, I was prepared before, but now I must make sure I'm prepared for the day of my death. You see, it was more important to him to be ready to meet God than it was for him to be rewarded by the king. Friend, that ought to tell you and I that there's more important matters in our life and one of the most important matters you'll ever do is get ready for your day. I don't care who you are in here. I don't care how old, young, how good a health, how bad a health. You've got an appointment with God. And you've got an appointment with death. Are you ready? Don't come up because there'll be no excuses given. They're not accepted. There was no excuses at that cross when Jesus shed his blood for you and me. And they will not be any excuses from you. Well, I was feeling bad. I couldn't go to church. I couldn't do this. I... Listen, it's up to you to find your way to prepare to meet your God. And how much have you wasted? We have so many people that have this in their mind, but it was an important matter to Barzella. And he had it on his mind, and he wanted to make sure he was prepared for it. And, and it's, an, it's a very important matter for you and me, and we should realize that. But there was a time here on his earth that he's drawing close, and he, there's something that we can learn from Barzella. First, I want you to listen very carefully, the celebration of the longevity of his life. Now, the scripture tells us in verse 32, now Barzella was a very aged man, even fourscore years old. Well, as I mentioned, he's 80 years old. He was a patriarch. And there was some things that the Bible wants us to see through the Jewish people that mentions about old age. And, and the Jewish people believe this, and it's backed up by scriptures, the stages of old age. Did you know there's stages of old age? Well, let me shock you just a moment. Where does that happen? Well, I'm going to give it to you and give scripture with it. First, I want you to see people that 60 to 70 years of age was spoken of as the commencement. What does that mean? The commencement. It's the beginning of old age. 60 years old is the beginning of old age according to scripture. And you have to see that what this is given to us, now listen very carefully, the beginning of old age, that's what the Israelites called it and he, in Psalm 90 verse 10, the days of our years are three score years and 10, now that's 70, and if by reason of strength they be four score, meaning 80, yet is their strength labor and sorrow for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Now, this is a picture of us down here. Some say we're going downhill, but actually we're going uphill. We're going uphill because it seems to be much harder for us to get to do the things we once did. So a lot of people say if you're going downhill uh, at your time of life, I'm telling you that, no, it begins to be an uphill because, you see, you may have to use a cane to walk up the hill where before you didn't. So you're going to have to see that there's a lot of changes. There's some moaning and groaning and aches and pains that are going to come upon you. Now listen, young people, you may think this is leaving you out. No, I'm giving you the picture of what's to come if you live old age. And old age starts at 60. And so according to Scripture, and the Scriptures are not wrong. And so we begin to see here, the older we get, the better we understand two things. That life is brief and it passes swiftly. As you heard me mention about losing friends, I was in school with these folks back in high school. And, and a lot of times when we run into each other, I said, remember the time we did, you know, you've done the same thing with classmates. You've, you've, uh, you remember them. And some of them you didn't have a lot of close contact with. But when they passed, 
You may say, I, I think I remember that person, and then you see it. Well, that's the, that's the reason you have annuals, to take a look at and look that person up so that I remember that. So you have to see that all of these things is basically brief in our life, and it passes swiftly. I'm telling you with all my life that uh, it don't seem like it was that long ago that I was waxing my 53 Chevrolet. And so I'm just telling you point blank, things like that, it just passes so swiftly. And this past week, uh, actually the uh, 11th, my, my son passed away. And he was 47. And that's been 11 years. And so I began to take a look and I'd say, you know, here again, it was swift for him, but it's swift for me. And it's going to be swift for everybody if you've lived your life accordingly. But then there's the second point, not only the commencement and the beginning, but the age is 70 to 80 years of age is called the hoary-headed age. Ah, a person of white hair has... Uh, was a meaning that you were looking history right in the face when you were around somebody like that. You know, you could learn a lot from the, the folks that's white-headed and gray-headed. And so you have to see that they're a walking history book. There's a lot of things that you could learn from them, but only if they're righteous people. And that means that people that have been led by God, still being led by God, and that is what a righteous person is. Now, it tells us very plainly here in Proverbs 16, 31, the hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. You see, one of the greatest things you can have in your old age, you say, well, I can't go out and visit, but look at all the young people that's looking to you. You, you may not realize it, but they're taking a picture of their mind and they're thinking about you even when you're not in church. They're, they'll pass through their mind. They'll see somebody that reminds them uh, of you. And all of a sudden, they'll, they'll maybe start doing a research in, in their mind about how that person is. Well, that person is a, is a good man. That's a good woman. That, that's beautiful that these people, I'm so happy we have them in our church. They actually begin to feel secure when you have the hoary head in the church. The children and the other people say, you know, one of the hardest funerals you'll see is when the church member loses one that's white-headed. They begin to think, oh, we have lost a chunk of the church right here. Why? Because they carried with them church history. And in that church history, it's not about the church, it's about the, the road that you're traveling and you take that person with that white hair and they can teach you the right way that we are going and they become a testimony of God. Did you know God loves the white headed person? I'm sure he's smiling with so many white hairs that have been dyed to something else. I kid Luke. I said, look how you like my brown hair. Preacher, your hair is white. And I said, oh, it just looks white. It's really brown. And, and so what do we see here is we're seeing what God says. And, and I can turn that around very easily and say to you, huh, why, well, Ann, God sees your hair white. Why? Because if she lives long enough, that's where it'll go. And, and understand that we must realize and believe that God has a special love for the hoary head. It's important that we realize that. Titus 2 says the aged men be sober, be grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity and in patience. These men of 70 to 80 years old are given six traits in the scriptures. One of them is they're to be clear-minded. What does that mean? Well, they're logically persuaded to the truth. They're reminded before they say something or exaggerate. Now, one of the bad things about older men and older women, but basically older men, they like to kid. And when they make fun of something or laugh at something, it's basically they've told a lie. 
So God is saying that the white man, the white haired man should be persuaded to the truth. In other words, does it mean that I cannot kid if you do it in truth? But you must realize these are very important traits, being clear minded. Second is being dignified, uh, worthy of respect. Well, you see, that person is a person that is being very respectful before the Lord. And that is very, very, very important. And the third thing is self-control. What is self-control? It means to be sensible. Being sensible. Self-control means to be sensible about things. In other words... Uh, I couldn't help but think of, of Jim again. I want to pick on him a little bit today. But when I was driving back and forth, finally, you know, Kay and Jim said, you know what, you just wear an your automobile. Just, when you get done, we'll let Jenny go to sleep downstairs and, and, uh, and you can study up here. And she took her nap and Jim, of course, he, he'd do the same. But then after I got through studying, he'd say, you finished? And I said, yeah. We would break out the ice cream. He'd take a half a gallon of ice cream and cut it down the middle. And he'd eat the other half and I eat the other. But what I mean about being in that particular point, again, number three, number three, uh, it, it's speaking here to us that self-control. Well, Jim said, that butter becomes pretty good. You want to just try the strawberry? Well, I'm trying to tell you that self-control is being sensible. I don't need another half a gallon. That's self-control. But if I don't have self-control, I say, yeah, and get a half a gallon of vanilla with it when you're doing it. So this is being sensible. Self-control is being sensible about things. A lot of people think self-control is controlling you. Well, it's first and foremost is control the sensibility of your decision. It's very, very important. But then not only self-control, but fourth, sound in their faith. You know, it's one thing to talk about something, but it's another to live it. In other words, when it says sound in their faith, you must realize that that white-haired person has gained respect from the younger generation and the middle age because they are preaching what they believe by the way they live their life. You see, a lot of times that's not happening. They'll say this and live this. In other words, the old worldly cliche says, do as I say, not as I do. And that's, that's what it's not to be. And that's worldly. You don't want that. That's something that we need to really be sure of. Fifth is sound in their love. It means the, a, a love that's focused. What does that mean to to have sound love? Well, that sound love means that (laughs) Barzella, I'm I'm cutting this sermon so short you just don't even realize it. But Barzella turns around and and David wants to reward him for what he did. And he said, I'm going to, I want to go take care of the most important matters and that's I'm getting ready to die. I want to make sure I've got everything in order. My house is in order. Now, I thank you for your reward, but how about giving it to Chisholm, this lowly, lovely servant who never asked for anything? You see, when a person is of age, they begin to realize how unimportant it is to have things. How many, and of course I'm probably going to hit a lot of Baptists on the foot with this one, how many aged men and women want to be millionaires? Well, what are you going to do with it? Oh, I'll give it to my children. I said you. My point I'm making to you is when you become of a certain age, you know what your comfort is? Staying warm when it's cold, <coughs> staying cool when it's hot, having enough food to eat, having clothes, having everything mad. And so a lot of times you see that's what, that's what the greatest thing for a person is. And, and it's not that you need to reward me of anything. You see, 
you'd rather have those comforts that God already is providing you. But in the same sense, what are we doing with it? Are we stepping on it or using it abusively? Are we supporting things that God hates? What are we doing with the things that God has provided for us to be in comfort? What and how are we living with what God has given us? You see, it's more important for you to love somebody else than it is to love yourself. That's when God will bestow blessings upon blessings upon you when you see that the Son of God did the very same thing. He cared more for you and I so much that He died for our sins. And God says, I want more like my son. And do you know how many, if you take a look, we're so full of selfishness. We're not willing to give. Do you know it would be almost like this. Doyle, Doyle's got a coat. And I said, Doyle, I want to give you this coat. And he'd say, okay, I'll take it. And Brent says, well, I, I needed a coat preacher. And Doyle says, well, that's mine. Did you understand what I just said? Why does he need a second coat when his brother doesn't have one? Why are you not caring more for others? And that's what God is looking to see in the hearts of those that belong to him. Where is that? We call it charity, but it's not the charity that men have, have thrown mud on. Charity means love. And what does God say about love? Love will... Cover a multitude of, of sin. You see, it's very important the things that God has given to us to describe the things of the elderly. How many men are fitting into those categories? And then, of course, there's steadfast. Boy, now that's a name, isn't it? You know, it really means to... Endure to the very end your allegiance to God. That's what steadfast means. I want to be steadfast. You see, a lot of times there's a lot of people started off really great in their Christian life. They stumbled and fell and picked themselves up and when they finished, they finished right. But did you know that you also have people that are living a life that started out great, doing all the things that they should, and their allegiance to God is great, but then at the end, they step off of that road and go their own way. You see, that's not what God wanted from you. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. You see, we're to be steadfast. We must be allegiance to God. And to his word. Do we stand there for that? And then the third thing is 80 years old to the end of life was called advanced stage. Jim, you've just entered advanced stage. And those reaching it were described as well stricken in years. I'm not going to call anybody's name. I'm just going to aggravate him. But my point I'm making to you is this. I'm about to cross that line to advanced age. Now, some of you are already there. So what does that mean? Well, let me give you a little bit of idea here. It's uh, reaching a described well stricken in years. Uh, there was considered to be much affliction, burdened down with aches and pain and sorrow in, in a lot of the cases. So Genesis 19 verse 11, I want to go back to something and I want you to listen why. Abraham and Sarah. And God visited Abraham and said, by this time next year, now, you've got to realize at this point when God visited, Sarah was 89. Okay? By this time next year, Sarah's going to have a child. <laughs> hey, I could, I could laugh with her now. I can get more understanding out of that right now. She is about to turn. No, I'm going to have a baby at 90 years old. You've got to be. That's the funniest thing I ever heard. 
You see, one of the things about being 80 plus advanced age is sometimes somebody would say, Jim, why don't you go out and let's have a softball game? Jim said, <laughs> Are you crazy? It's all I can do to walk. And so we begin to see things the same way Sarah did. What did Sarah do? Sarah laughed. She was full of emotions when somebody asked her to do something that she knew was physically impossible. That's exactly what advanced age means. You see, we have to realize something else. There's nothing impossible with with God. Amen. So when he said it was going to happen, it was going to happen. So well advanced age is what it's speaking. Sarah was 90 years old when she gave birth to Isaac. She had reached the last stage of her old age. And that's what that means. 80 plus is the last stage of old age. You know, Brazilla had reached that third stage of old age. As a matter of fact, it was his birthday, and, and that's what put him to thinking. He said, gosh, I'm 80 years old. You know, David, David's going to honor me today, but I, what was the forefront of his thinking? 80 years old. 80 years old. He knew what the, the advanced age meant. He knew that from here on, your days are numbered. Now listen to me. Not your years. Did you know the Bible tells us that we're not to number our years? We're to number our days. We're to number our days that we are expecting. Why? Because you hear your pastor pray this so many times. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. One day at a time. One day at a time. Oh God, thank you for one more day. Not about tomorrow. Not about yesterday. I don't want to take the clouds of yesterday and pull them over the sunshine of today. I don't want to look to something over here that I have no control over that I may not even see tomorrow. So why not rejoice and be happy? In the Lord that He's given you today. So it's a very important point. Brazilla, I'm 80. Oh, I've reached advanced age. I'm no longer going to count my years. I'm going to count my days. I'm going to make every day count. And I know one way to get prepared for my meeting of God, every single day that I have left over this 80 years old, I'm going to give it to Him. I'm going to do everything I can to exalt Him. The only problem with that, He should have been doing it long before. I gave you the characteristics of the old man, but it's the characteristics of us all. Do you care more for yourself than someone else. Well, preacher, do you think that I, I'm going to care for some drug addict more so than I am my husband or my wife? No. No. That would be physically wrong. It would be spiritually wrong. But I am saying that when you know there's some people that need you, we need to show that charity. That love. Because they may not have anybody. They may not have any resource to meet their need. So many times, did you know God's got every action already in store? He's already planned out some things for you and gives you absolutely every availability to do what He's asked you to do in His Word. And He goes ahead and He just lines it all up. And you're not even expecting it. You're in a restaurant and somebody has maybe ordered a very meek meal, but it might be because they couldn't afford more. And you notice it. Now, why did you notice it? 
Why did God bring that to your attention? And that's who did it, by the way. He brought it to your attention. How about in the grocery store? Some little old woman up here, and she's got every generic brand that you could think of, but you could probably put it in one bag. And she's trying to figure out, counting her money and everything, trying to see how she's going to pay it. I drove through McDonald's the other Saturday morning. And I had ordered, I, I really love their Egg McMuffin sausage and egg. It's just something I like. And as I got up there and had, had my own coffee, but that's what I ordered. And when I pulled up, <laughs> the lady said, uh, I said, how much is it? You, you, she said, oh, the guy in front of you paid for it. I tooted my horn and he just and drove right on. He didn't come around and say, are you going to thank me? No. He just did it out of the goodness of his heart. Why? Well, you see, you may not see what I saw. God was preparing me for this message. He showed his love for me. And I'm sharing it with you that you may see the same thing. You can say, well, you don't know how many times I've been in need and nobody come forward. Well, I got news for you. God had made sure that if you were in need, He would have met your need because He spoke to hearts and they just didn't do it and therefore they're going to have to be accountable for it. You see, God puts that availability in your life and then you turn around and you don't recognize the availability that God has given you to help that person. You just decide, just like Doyle, he's going to keep both coats. It's being selfish. You know, there's more people that contemplate in how to get money and how to get something free than they are to give. They're not givers, they're takers. That's a selfish human being. No blessings. They'll never grow or ever have anything. And what they have, Jesus said, those that have, it will be taken away. Time after time after time, people's had a chance to repent of that very thing, but they haven't. You see, it's very important for you and I. But he had reached the third stage of his old age. You know, the long life of Brazil had been a fateful and fruitful life. Uh, his life had not been lived in vain. Uh, as a matter of fact, God had made him profitable. Why? Well, I don't know if you see what I see. Here was a patriarch, a man that had a lot of wealth. And God made sure he had it when David needed it. Did you hear a good amen out of that? It wasn't he was blessing Barzilla. He was preparing the need of King David. He knew everything that's going to take place. He knows every step that we're going to take. Did you know that he prepares things to keep you out of harm's way? You know that person that's poking along like Rita Black driving the speed limit and you're in a hurry? And she steps up to the stoplight and she stops and she's listening to Elvis sing and you're tooting the horn. she say, don't that woman hear me? Well, you know, then you get on down the road and you're starting to pull out in traffic and whoom, tractor trailer just went through, run the red light. And if you'd have been two or three seconds faster... You have been hung up on the front of that tractor trailer. God used Rita to be slow. You see, we don't see God every single day because you don't look for it. You call it luck. And luck has nothing in the divine process. You must realize what that man said yesterday. Trump got shot in the ear. And the reason it was just the ear, there was a divine intervention. 
Do you see God in your life every day? Well, maybe you're not looking for it. Maybe you're too busy to look for it. I like to look. And at the end of my day, I like to look. But when I'm looking, I also see the devil in it too. I see how many times that he's tried to get me off course. Let's use revenge for a moment. Do you know why a person hates? They want revenge of something somebody's done to them. Do you know why? The devil can distract you that you're not thinking of God. You're thinking about your own selfish desires. That's what revenge is. It's a selfish desire. And Satan makes sure that you're eat up with it. You know why? So it will take you away from the divine process of God. You're not looking for God. You're looking for selfish desires to be fulfilled. I'm going to get even with that person. You know, Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He said, have y'all not understood yet? When I fed the 5,000, how many baskets did you pick up after the feeding? Oh, 12. And yet you don't understand why? All of those were broken pieces. He said, I don't think you understand. And when I fed the 4,000, there was seven baskets of broken pieces. What does that mean? And they didn't have a clue. They couldn't pick up on it. And do you know what was really funny? It's not funny. Miss word. Most Christians don't know what that means. What did those 12 baskets mean? He said, look at yourself. You're going to be, every one of those baskets are broken pieces. You're going to be a broken piece for me. All 12 of you. Well, what about the seven? There were seven nations that occupied Israel. And God broke them. He sent hornets and everything else to run them out. And then the Jewish people. So understand that everything God does has a purpose. And when you begin to see, well, all we want to see is He fed 5,000. Oh, He fed 5,000 men, so that must have been 20,000 people. No, 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 no. That's not the whole purpose of the feeding. The feeding was the 12 baskets to tell His disciples He was still teaching. I wanted you to see that each one of those baskets represents you. You will be broken for me. And they were. You see, God has a purpose for every single thing in His Word. Why can we not see it? We cloud our minds with so much sin and so much things that we're going to do that has nothing to do with God. And when it does come to God, it says, I just don't have time to go to church. I just don't have time. Don't have a clue that God has directing you to get to church because He wants to answer all of your doubts. that had accumulated through the weeks and the months and the years. <sighs> Barzilla says, whatever you're going to reward me with, give it to Chapel. Don't give it to me. One thing I can say about him, he knew exactly what was important. And that was prepare. You know, he was aware that death was an uncertain matter. Verse 34, And Barzillus said to the king, How long have I to live that I should go up with the king into Jerusalem? Older people do not like to pull up roots and relocate. One of the funeral directors, he, he said, you're, you're mentioned about in every funeral home that is around here. We've had meetings and all these things and said, and you're, you're one of the forefronts. We're just trying to figure out 
why have you stayed at that church all these years? And I said, because that was God's plan for me and for that church. Now, not everybody agrees with God's plan. But I let God deal with that. But my point to you is very simple. Old people don't like to relocate. If you looked at my resume, <coughs> somebody, somebody told me, said, you, you have a resume that can go on one page with the number of places that you've worked and you've worked good night. The least one I've seen was seven years. Yeah. I just don't like to relocate and change. Why? Why should I? Some people say, well, the grass is greener on the other side, only over a septic tank. It's not going to happen. I enjoy what I enjoy, and whether I'm preaching at some church or this church, I certainly love to preach. But he was aware that death was... A Uncertain time. And I got news for every single one of us. Now I'm going to read you a story and then we're going to dismiss, but just listen carefully. It could halfway be comical, but I'll let you decide. True story, by the way. That's why I want to use it. And it pertains to death, okay? A few years ago, and I was reading a book called It Happened in Tennessee. Now the book's available. You can get it at your library or Look it up online. But it told the story of a man by the name of Felix Brazil. And uh, they called him Uncle Bush. And he lived in Roan County, Tennessee. In June of 1938, 74-year-old Uncle Bush drew national attention. On that hot Sunday afternoon, he attended his own funeral. Yes, I said that right. He attended his own funeral and listened while his own eulogy was delivered. People had come from all across the nation for the event, and it was held to be the largest rural gathering ever in the state of Tennessee. The highly publicized funeral was scheduled for 2 p.m., but by 9 a.m., more than a 1,000 people had already assembled outside the small wooden Cave Creek Baptist Church near Kingston. You know, he had to be a Baptist if he wanted to head ahead of time. You know, we can't wait for nothing. As the morning and the early afternoon wore on, cars, trucks, and buses continued to arrive, filling every available field and barnyard. By the time the funeral began, an estimated 8,000 people had assembled. Cars double parked along the narrow dirt road leading to the church, and it created such a traffic jam that the funeral procession was delayed for 40 minutes. While state highway patrolmen worked to clear a path for the procession, concessions, now get this, concession stands, I know the Church of God would be there, concession stands dispensed cold drinks and sandwiches as everyone eagerly awaited their first glimpse of the living corpse. The procession finally arrived, led an undertaker from Luton with several press cars following. Then came the hearse with the deceased seated by the driver. In the back was the black walnut casket that Uncle Bush had built for himself. Once they arrived at the church, the eager mob surged forward to get a look at once again the officers that had to clear the way for the pallbearers to carry the empty coffin to its place. Uncle Bush, with his long white beard neatly combed, followed the pallbearers and sat beside the coffin as the service began. Gospel groups from Knoxville, Kingston, Chattanooga provided the music. Reverend Charles Jackson had come from Paris, Illinois to deliver the sermon. The whole thing had got started years earlier when Uncle Bush had started making his own coffin. He told reporters that Bowden caskets were cheaply made and he wanted a good one. So he built his own with trees that grew on his farm. While he labored over his coffin, he thought of its intended purpose and began to wonder what his funeral would be like. Soon he was consumed by an intense desire to see that the services were conducted in the right manner 
and that the facts of his life were correctly set out. Local papers discovered his plan and began to publicize them. When people read about the strange event about to take place, they wanted to have a part in it. A Knoxville funeral home took the handmade coffin and lined it. A Knoxville businessman brought him to Knoxville and had him fitted for a suit. Florists from Knoxville, the North City, and Chattanooga donated flower arrangements. After the funeral service, Uncle Bush moved among the crowd shaking hands and signing with an X the program that had been printed for the occasion. After the service, he took the homemade casket home. In the weeks to come, Uncle Bush was in constant demand. He rode in local parades, made personal appearance at theaters, and appeared on Ripley's Believe It or Not radio program. He was also featured in Life magazine. But five years later, on February the 9th, 1943, Felix Brazil died. At his request, only a song and a prayer were used at his simple graveside service. He was laid to rest in his own homemade coffin. The preacher, why did you read that? Well, you can have your funeral before you die if you wish. But sooner or later, you're going to have an appointment with the real thing called death. So what do I do to prepare? Well, my Lord, Jesus Christ says, I have defeated hell, death, and the grave. And if you enter me like Noah entered the ark, you're protected from all of it. You see the truth of that and made real in mine and your life, it wasn't over. The moment he died, he didn't even blink an eye until he was in the presence of God to give an account of his life. What if you had to give an account today? Could you tell me? Do you think it would be pleasing to God or just pleasing to you? Do you think you have excuses that you can fill up that God would be accepting it? When his son went to die for our sins, not excuses. You see, whatever was paid for on that cross, that's what we need to be with all our heart. That the blood of Christ will cleanse us from all sin. Because the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. You see, the thing that you and I need to realize is this message about old age. It just gives us a pattern and an outline for our life. Now, people will ignore this and people will forget it. But I can assure you that I've done my part. And that is to do one thing. Give you fair warning that just because you're young or just because you're old doesn't mean you're going to live much longer. And if you're not physically and spiritually physically ready to die, you're not ready to spiritually live. And that's why a lot of people can't live the Spirit-filled life. They are not prepared to live it. So it gives us an insight to say, I need to prepare myself for the spiritual life. How I can show God and do the things of God. And it's not worked by salvation by any means. It is to please the one who died for you and me. Barzilla? Well, we don't have to take a second thought. He died. And I believe he was ready. 
His priority was not in being rewarded for what he had done. And that's where a lot of people think. And they stay out of church. You know, they, they think they've done enough good works. It would please God. Oh, how wrong. Oh, how lost they are. Because they're believing in their own works above the ones that the Christ did for us at Calvary. Are you prepared? What if this is your day? Are you ready? You see, you can be. Not through me. But if the Holy Spirit has been speaking to your heart, you need to come today. You need to come and say, I want to be ready for my day when I meet my Savior. Because if you're not, He's not going to be your Savior. He's going to be your judge. So I hope and pray today, if you're not spiritually ready to die, you're not spiritually ready to live. And you can't. And Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the preparation, Lord, of this to speak to our hearts because we know, Lord, that it was prepared by You. Holy God, have mercy on us, the sinner, for we are. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.